Okay, we can go ahead and get started. I see that we have a, a good number of participants ready to go. So um, I just wanted to say thank you for, for joining our webinar here today. Um, I'm just going to go over a few housekeeping rules. So we have um, any questions that you may have, please do enter them into the Q&A box um, that you'll find at the bottom of your screen. Um, and we will have time for questions. So please, please do feel free to add any questions there. Also, we do have live interpretation um, for this webinar in Spanish. In order to, to change into Spanish, you'll have a interpretation button at the bottom of your screen as well. And if you click there, you can choose uh, the Spanish language. Um, so feel free to do so. Um, so today we have our speaker who is uh, Olivia Murray. Olivia is a teaching fellow in anatomy at the University of Edinburgh, where she teaches across a range of undergraduate and postgraduate courses. And her teaching and research interests are divided between the fields of medical education and reproduction. And formerly a midwife, she loves to spend time delving deep into research on reproductive health and is motivated to continuously improve the teaching she delivers by engaging with technology, enhancing learning. So Olivia, please take it away. Hi Daphne, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, it is lovely to chat with you today um, and to just catch up about a couple of things on medical education. Um, so what I would like to talk to you about today is using complete anatomy in the DR as we call it across some universities in the UK or the dissection room. Um, or whatever it is, the lab, we can't uh, constantly refer to it as a lab. So whatever it is for you, um, I just wanted to give you a bit of um, context on how we um, can use as educators that we can use complete anatomy within our dissection classes. Um, I'm currently based at the University of Edinburgh and our anatomy is taught by dissection to a small cohort of our um, anatomy students. For example, our undergraduate medical students do not dissect. They learn anatomy by prosection um, alongside CA, I might say, but um, they don't necessarily dissect themselves. So they are viewing models that have been or cadaveric material that has been um, dissected previously, usually by members of, of staff, teaching staff or um, technical staff. When it comes to our students that are taught by a dissection, so they are doing the dissection themselves. That's our two master's programs. So our master's in human anatomy and our master's in clinical anatomy. Um, they both use dissection. So in that instance, um, in groups of about three or four people to an entire body, they take two semesters to dissect um, a full body. So um, starting out with the upper limb, lower limb, and then going through to the trunk, um, head and neck region in second semester. Um, so they have pretty much the entire week to do a subset of dissections that we assign to them. And then they will come into the lab as they wish throughout the week. Um, and they will have about three hours where they are uh, supervised. So they have academic support in their dissection, but otherwise they undertake all of the dissection themselves. Um, so it's all self-directed. The way we tell them what to dissect or how to dissect is we reference a textbook. Um, for this, the master's in human anatomy and the master's in clinical anatomy, we use Grant's dissector um, and they will be assigned um, a certain number of pages of the dissection to work through every week. Um, as I said, mostly self-directed with some academic support and the place, I suppose, that 3D um, anatomy opens up and specifically complete anatomy um, opens up in this is, is helping them with the guidance because the most common question we get, I mean, every single week, three or four times a week is what, what is this and can I cut it? Um, I guess it's a pretty significant thing if you cut through something that you were supposed to. Granted, it's not uh, life or death, it's not surgery, thankfully, because somebody cut through a sciatic nerve, had it between a forceps the other day and was like, what is this? It's like, a sciatic nerve so pretty chunky but uh somehow they got through it um so just put that back down and pretended like it was all still attached but um i guess there's an awful lot of those accidental um dissections things that are accidentally dissected because of a lack of knowledge because when you're looking at the cadaver it is quite often monochromatic um, and difficult to tell what is what 
We have a second group of students who also do dissection. They're biomedical science undergraduate students, um, and they have a smaller amount of dissection. Um, they do about two hours a week, which is supervised by academic staff the whole time. So our postgraduate students have more self-directed learning, but the undergraduate students do um, more focused on a specific area. So we have two programs that they dissect on. One is um, a head and neck course. So they, between four of them, they will dissect a head and neck. Um, and we also have a limbs course, which is where they're dissecting just the limbs of the body. So students don't normally take both of those courses. They will choose to take one or the other. And they are biomedical science undergrad students or BSc interrelating students for the most part. Um, they follow a dissector textbook less strictly. They kind of um, are guided by the academic staff in presence um, who will tell them what they're supposed to be doing because they don't really have time to be sitting there and trying to work out what everything is and then work out how to do the dissection as well. They have an awful lot to get through in a very small amount of time. Um, so quite often it is academic support that will guide them more specifically. There's about 25 students, I think, on that course. So not huge numbers. The same ish numbers on the MSc clinical and human anatomy programs. Um, so that's, I suppose, how we teach dissection here in Edinburgh. I'm sure everybody else um, will have different ways that they are teaching dissection, different students, whether it's undergraduate medical students. Um, but I guess the crux of what I am going to focus on today is how we integrate technological support to those students, how we get that sciatic nerve reattached so that we can identify before we accidentally take it out. Um, we currently do that um, at the moment in our dissection labs. The students have an iPad in a wonderful, very uh, watertight case. Um, that they have with them alongside um, the cadaver that they're dissecting. Um, and on that laptop or that on that iPad is um, a selection of textbooks. Um, Grant's dissector will obviously be there because they will be referencing that for um, the walkthrough of the dissection that they're doing. Um, but also complete anatomy. And um, complete anatomy is not something that we force upon the students. It's something that we suggest as an aid. Um, and quite often we find students using it almost all day, every day. Um, and that was kind of where this whole uh, webinar series came from, because it's really useful for them to see what uh, what they would what they could do. And the idea of having bespoke pre-made material for them, which I'm going to show you, um, is something that can really, really enhance their learning. Um, so when it comes to what's actually happening within the group themselves, not everybody's dissecting at the same time. There's usually two people, one person either side of the body um, with hands on uh scalpels scissors always probe blunt dissection before sharp dissection but um forceps whatever they have their their hands in the body and then the other one or two members of the group usually is supporting them helping them to identify structures um talking through what the textbook says so you know put your left hand in, in here and um use blunt dissection to cut through whatever structure that is so um and they will also usually have complete anatomy open as well to help them to identify what structures they're looking at so what I wanted to show you was just a little bit of um, the resources that um, are created in order to support their learning. So I might just share my screen with you and hopefully um, you'll be able to see. Daphne, can you just confirm that you can see um, my PowerPoint presentation? We sure can. Thank you. Great. So these are our three main dissector guides um, that we have. Grant's dissector is the one that we um, normally use for reference, um, but Gray's is a really, really nice um, photographic dissector. So um, Clements and Grant's are the two kind of illustration dissectors um, that I am most familiar with. Somebody else in the audience might want to suggest something else that um, they use, but I think the basics of what each dissection textbook does is the same. Um, usually a regional approach. So starting with head and neck and dissecting through, you know, whatever structures there, or, um, you know, kind of everybody will have a, a sub -chapter, a chapter on the orbital region. Everybody will have a chapter on the nasal cavity. Everybody will have a chapter on the oral cavity. So whatever dissection textbook you use, um, the content is usually quite the same. The only thing I would say about the Gray's one is because it's a photographic atlas, it kind of adds to that level of detail that the students um, are able to interpret what's in the textbook versus what is what they're expected to do. Um, Grants and Clements use illustrations for the most part. But as I said, we mostly focus on our use of Grants Dissector um, here at the University of Edinburgh. 
And what I want to show you is just an example of the Corax section, for example. So this is what the Thorax chapter looks like. Um, so this is the front page of it. And then it is divided into subsections um, of which we'll have surface anatomy, um, the skeleton, and then the first dissection, I think, is the intercostal space here. So these are the, just three context providing um, subsections. And then each of these following on will be um, individual dissections themselves. So as you can see here, first dissecting the intercostal space, then um, removing the anterior thoracic wall, looking at the oral cavities, et cetera. Um, what I want to do is just concentrate on that intercostal space and talk you through what my process is when it comes to making this kind of material. So what I do usually is read through the dissector and where have I put my dissector? Here it is here. Um, read through the dissector. Um, the students will have been assigned a certain number of pages to get through is usually what we say. So they'll start at page 63 and maybe they'll have to make it through to 70 by the end of the week. Um, you can see at the start of the chapter, there's an awful lot of context provided here, just introducing um, things they will probably have learned in a principal's lecture. Um, and then this yellow text is where we start with the dissection instructions. So there's 12 bullet points here. And I have just read through these and kind of pulled apart what I think is relevant to apply to complete anatomy. So um, or what can be, let me say that better, what can be better explained um, using a visual aid like complete anatomy. So what I've done then is I will break these down. So into screen one, I'm going to talk about that bullet point, which is detached through his anterior. And I've also just created a brief instruction that I will include in the text box. And I'll talk to you, I'll show you text box in a second. Um, but for each of these, I've just taken a little bit more detail. This is going to be two is intercostal space identification. My screen three will be reflecting the external intercostal muscle. Screen four will be um, reflecting the internal intercostal muscle. And where I've got all of this information from is directly out of the dissector. So I don't know if you can see here, maybe hopefully this is big enough. But um, so detached serratus anterior, I've not taught this stuff up myself. And as I say, it's probably the same across most textbooks. Um, palpate the ribs, dissect um, intercostal space four, identify the external intercostal muscle. So as I've read through this, I've tried to think about the process and what would be involved with each dissection and then kind of to package each one to make a screen out of each one. So I then start making my screens um, and let's look at complete anatomy in order to see how we've done that. So I'm going to show you this, I suppose, from the finished product perspective first, and then maybe we can talk through, you know what I've done beforehand, um, and then we can talk through how I get to the finished product. So I have a dissection course, and in that dissection course, I have um, broken things down. These are each individual courses, and they're regional-based courses. So if we, maybe let's use head and neck as an example. So if I open up that head and neck, divide it into modules, so these week one here is a module, week two is another module, week three, four. So each of those modules contains a specific dissection and that dissection, so these four dissections should be completed in the first week, week one, the first week of head and neck dissection. And that will correspond with the pages that the students are assigned to get through within the, within the lab in the week. So um, review the surface anatomy is the first dissection, so section two is the anterior triangle of the neck. Three is the thyroid and parathyroid root of the neck. So you can see here, then we kind of go a bit deeper with the scalp, um, the muscles of mastication, the muscles of facial expression, the parotid region, pretty straightforward. Um, but I've just copied and pasted these directly out of the book. So you'll, that list that I showed you for the thorax is similar here. So it will be brain, cranial fossa, orbit, um, nasal cavity, oral cavity, and so on. So that's kind of what the finished product looks like to a student when they will then they will open the course and they will see that in week four, here are the one, two, three, four, five different lectures that they have to get through. And then they can see what they've done through the whole course of the year and look back on it and also then maybe look forward to what they're doing um, next week. When it comes to that thorax session then, so week one, what they're defined, um, the defined dissection for them will involve um, reviewing the surface anatomy, obviously before they take any skin off, a great place to start. Um, can't be done after the skin has been removed. Um, dissecting the intercostal space, the removing the anterior thoracic wall, 
dissection with pleural cavities and then the lungs. And then in week two, obviously looking in towards the heart and radius dynamo. Um, I've also included a review here. So we'll talk about that um, towards the end, but um, a really important element that I find is very important for the students to make sure they're catching up on what we want them to. So for each of these lectures, so because we're inside a course, inside a module, we have a lecture. Um, and each of these individual lectures then are comprised of a number of screens. Um, for example, the surface anatomy review, I, I've totally cheated here. And I have just pulled a load of screens from the Gray's Atlas that's in um, Complete Anatomy. And I will show you how to do that in a second. But um, I've just pulled a load of screens that I think are useful. And the students then can just make their way through those and ensure that they have so this is the surface anatomy screen for the thorax, right? I haven't reinvented the wheel here at all, um, but this will just talk me through, um, or talk the students through the things that they are supposed to palpate. And they will hopefully correspond with, when we, oh, I mean, sorry, when we look in the textbook, they will hopefully correspond with the things that they are asked to palpate. So the surface anatomy, turn the cadaver into a supine position and palpate the following structures, jugular notch, clavicle, acromion, and if we go back to our complete anatomy screen, jugular notch, clavicle is here, or chromium, et cetera. So I've, I've not reinvented the wheel there at all. I've just included um, the different slides from complete anatomy um, to show all of those structures as they are. OK, so nothing too, uh, too complex there. And I've just pulled a load of those screens in that I think the students should know that correspond with what they talked about in the textbook. Um, but I think that the students should know in advance of doing their dissection. Things that will have been covered in a preparatory lecture or in a principal's lecture, um, the arrangement of structures in the intercostal space, for example, um, the pleura neurovascular bundle. Um, we know students are definitely building up their knowledge in a dissection lab, but we hope that they're not learning things for the first time, like the arrangement of the intercostal muscles. We hope that when they go into the lab, they are knowing that the external are going to be external to the internal. Pretty straightforward, but um, we're hoping that they already have that level of knowledge. So this first um, session is really, or this first lecture is really what I'm hoping they already know, and it's really a review. Moving on then to the dissection, you can see here I've just created another lecture, and in that lecture I've included a number of screens. There are only five screens in this lecture, that's not to say there's not a lot of content though. Um, so let's have a look at what's in each of these screens. I have used my labels. I have used, sorry, I'm just gonna play around with the Zoom controls that get in the way all the time. Um, I've used a text box here. I've used my three-dimensional pen and I've used some labels in order to get through this first learning objective that I set out. And if I go back to my PowerPoint presentation and I go to screen one, this was the direction that I had taken directly out of the textbook. Detached serratus anterior from its proximal attachments and the upper eight or nine ribs. And as I'm looking through this, I'm like, okay, how are they going to identify the eight or nine ribs? I hope that they will know, my is a bit sideways here. I hope that they will know to start counting at rib two from this external angle. So I've just put that in there um, to give them a bit of incentive to remind themselves what that is. Going lateral to that will give me rib two and then count all the way down to ribs three, four, five. This is just the 3D pen tool that I've used in order to illustrate the numbers of the ribs. And then I've drawn in orange where they should detach um, the proximal attachments of serratus anterior muscle from the upper eight or nine ribs. What I hope you can see here is the power of that three-dimensional image because in the textbook, this is what they've got. Detached serratus anterior from its proximal attachments in the upper eight or nine ribs. I hope that what you can see is that this is actually saying the exact same thing, but in a slightly different way, and one that will lead them to knowing exactly what the dissection is that they should be doing. Um, moving on then to the next point. So identify the fourth intercostal space, the external intercostal muscle, the external intercostal membrane, and then noting the organization of the fibers. So these are the four but full of excuse me, these are the four bullet points that I have put into my text box. And I've used a couple of labels to help them to identify the intercostal membrane and the intercostal muscle itself. Just illustrated the fourth and fifth ribs here. Like super straightforward and super basic um, when you know the answer. But what I'm hoping here is that the students, it leaves space for the students to construct their own knowledge. Um, but 
but I'm really trying to cadaver that's in front of them so that they have the iPad in one hand, the cadaver on the table in front of them, and they can apply the information from the iPad onto the cadaver very, very easily. The intention is not to use this um, in place of the dissection guide. Obviously, the dissection guide has an awful lot of very relevant information in it. If we go back to the dissection guide, um, you can see there's an awful lot more information here. So um, all of this would be those three bullet points, the four bullet points that I've included. There's an awful lot more information there and helpful things like referencing, you know, here's, they can go to Netters page 183 and see the same illustration. Um, but there's an awful lot more information there. And we're picking a pretty basic dissection here um, when it comes to things like, I don't know, inside the cranium, there's an awful lot more detail that will be required there. Um, just moving on then to look at my next um, screen, same thing again, a text box with the bullet points that I had um, created and then some labels to show the musculature that they're dissecting using a three, two and three dimensional pen again. And then hopefully at this point they will have got, so identify the innermost intercostal muscle, identify the internal, and we're looking at the neurovascular bundle there. I, I promise you this took me very short amount of time to create that. I know it's only five screens, but to create that um, individual lecture. Let me show you how I have done each of those though. So what I'm gonna do is just go back to curriculum manager. I'm gonna fight the Zoom menu the whole way through it. Um, so what I talked about first was using, was creating the reviewing content. If you click Atlas at the hub, um, that brings me to, should bring me to all of my Grey's Anatomy screens. Let's go back to the library here. Um, so there's my Atlas. I'll just show you that again, going from the hub. So clicking on Atlas in the hub will bring me through to this screen, um, which shows me all of the content that is made in concert with Grey's Atlas of Anatomy. I have filtered, I can filter by regions here. Um, if I'm looking for something in the head and neck using this menu and then thorax here, let's fight that through the menu again. So looking at everything in the thorax. What you'll notice is a handful of these are familiar from the review slide. There's the surface anatomy um, image that you saw earlier. Here is some more surface anatomy images, surface anatomy with mediastinum. Um, so when I made that lecture, I just opened up all of these and dragged and dropped them straight into that review lecture. When it came to making the content for the um, individual dissection screens, um, it obviously requires a little bit more manipulation, but it's not still not difficult. Let's have a look at making that screen, which was reflecting the external intercostal muscles. So really the first dissection one um, that we asked them to do. So I'm just going to use um, a screen here that I think, let's go with that one actually. So one that I think will be useful. It doesn't have to have everything that I need, but what I don't wanna do is just start making the screen from scratch every single time, because that is the real time killer um, when it comes to making screens. I'm just gonna close out of the library and I'm actually going to remove all of the labels that are here because I don't want those labels. I'm also going to remove the two pectoralis muscles because I don't want those. And hopefully the students have also reflected out their serratus anterior muscles because I've asked them to do that in a previous dissection. So just for context, this is the four uh, bullet points that I'm asking them to do. So I'm gonna identify the fourth intercostal space, external intercostal muscle, um, external intercostal membrane, and then no the orientation of the fibers. No, this is what I'm going to get them to do. Sorry. Insert a probe deep to the external intercostal muscle um, and then push the probe laterally. What I want them, what I really want them to take out of this is to use the probe as a guide and then use the scissors to cut along the external intercostal muscle along the inferior border of the rib so that they don't catch that neurovascular bundle in the subcostal space. So as you saw, what I did in the previous one was I just went through, I pulled out a pen, let's use our 3D pen. I'm going to do that in orange. Oh, let's start actually, let's label our, so I do it correctly, let's label our uh, ribs. So one, two, three. We, oh, we asked them to be in the 
fourth intercostal space. So let's go back, get my pen back out. We'll label this set seven, six. That's one, two, three, four. If you could do this right, that would be great. So that's going to be four. That one is going to be five. I'm going to input my text box at this point, just to give me a bit of direction. Um, I want to just copy and paste each of these. I'm just going to take that whole body of text and copy it. And that's going to be what goes in my text box. A little bit of reformatting to do here, just because I had it formatted as a bullet point list in um, PowerPoint. But if you're not doing this, you're not doing it right. I really don't need to leave it. Bye, I'm back here. Okay, let's put three in there. And then we're going here with four. So that's going to be five and not three. Okay, so let me just get rid of those. Okay. What I'm going to do is just use a little bit of subliminal subliminal communication and match the color of the 3D pen that I'm using to the direction that I want them to, um, the direction that I'm trying to create for them. So I'm asking them to insert a probe into second, third. I knew I had labels that was wrong. Let's clear that pen. It's going to, I'm, I'm faffing about, but bear with me. Okay, so two, three, this one's going to be four here. And this one's going to be five. Let's take out that orange pen, make the marker a little bit bigger. And just kind of illustrate that I'm going to put the probe in there. Never be too obvious, right? So what they should see then is insert the probe, orange thing, great, orange thing goes in there into the external intercostal muscle. And actually what you'll find is in the directions for um, the, in the text, what it'll say is on the lateral border of the body of the sternum. So I'm hoping that they have carried that inform information as well. Push the probe laterally into the space between the external intercostal and internal intercostal muscles. Use the scissors to cut along the inferior border. Let's do this again. Inferior border, let's go to that in pink. And then, Label that inferior border of rib four with the pink pen. 3D pen in pink. It's a bit rough and ready. But what I hope you can see is that it really doesn't take too long. And I want them to go as far as the mid axillary line. I'm going to put that in blue. And then turn that around. Find my little number here. Find my mid axillary line and then take my blue pen and just do the same thing there again. So show them that mid axillary line. I'm doing this on a laptop. I have an iPad as well on the 3D pen, which uh, makes much straighter lines. But okay, that's what I have shown them. And I also asked them to identify, I think the screen I had is while I was asking them, just put a couple of labels on there to. Um, identify the membrane and the muscle. Okay, do that. I can just move this and do it. There we go, because that's just a repeat. I think that's going to be a little bit smaller. And then there we're done. And then just click save screen. I'm going to save that actually as number three, reflect external intercostal muscles, because when it comes back to putting all of these into a lecture, it's really useful to be able to reference what I've put in my PowerPoint here and then just drag them directly into the label, um, into the lecture correctly. Save that in my dissection course and click save. I could also filter them by thorax here if I was thinking about it. That's what I would have done. But um, okay. The next thing I would do then is just move on to screen four. I would probably actually use the same image that I've got here. Um, clear the tools that I have. So clear my labels, clear the pen. I'll probably keep the text box because I can just have a layer of that text and take it out. I'm not going to necessarily go through this one, but what I just want to show you is, so I've asked them to, to 
court take out the um they should have reflected the intercostal muscle at this point i can't reflect it on ca but what i can do is just use that lasso tool to put through the external intercostal and its membrane up to the point and then what i've done is expose the internal intercostal you can see the fibers running in a different orientation there and that's what i would use then for the next um screen so I'm kind of building the screens, but I've started from a place of the atlas that has allowed me to just dive straight into it. I don't have to think about add this structure, add that structure. All of those structures are already there. Okay, when it comes to putting that all together, I go to my curriculum manager and I'm gonna to go to lectures. Um, I wanna look in my lectures that I have saved in the dissection course. You can see this is all of the lectures that I have for, uh, the dissection course, so there's an awful lot here. Um, but what I would just do is make a dissection just using this, or sorry, make it lecture, just using this plus icon over here. Um, and I'll just show you because I can just open this one to edit it. Um, I put a description in there of what they're doing. Um, and I've taken that actually from the textbook as well. So the order of dissection will be as follows, just to talk them through the sternocleidomastoid muscle, that's the wrong information. Anyway, I've also put a picture in front of it. And in order to add my resources, um, let me just go here, click to add um, a couple of titles, add my resources, and then find, I'm gonna look for screens. I'm gonna go to my dissection course, um, probably all models because I forgot to search. But what I can do here is see one transverse cut is in there, two, oh, I seem to be missing two. So I can just pick up that intercostal space um, I need to drop it in here and then just change the order of them. So just bring two up there. Um, but you can see here the numbers really help me when it comes to what uh, I'm supposed to be doing. I also want to add five neurovascular bundle in there, maybe, um, for example. Save the lecture. Save to lectures and courses. And that's done. That will then just usually get a little um, saving window there, which will usually take a couple of seconds just to complete. And then when it comes to my courses, go back into that 4X course and then just pop them. Because I numbered them, I can just pop them all into the right place. Add a lecture is really straightforward, as easy as it is. Just tick it and then click add to course. I don't want to do that, so I'm not going to. Um, but it's really straightforward. And as I said here, I've just put a little bit of management on them to um, give them modules and name the modules by number. The last thing I just want to show you is how to make this review content. Um, that is just a lecture and I haven't made one of these for my head and neck dissection. So I'm going to make one of those for the head and neck dissection. Um, I think I have it, but I don't have anything in it. So let's edit this lecture. You can see there's no content. There's no resources in it. All I have is a picture on the front and head and neck review. Here's when I prepared earlier. So, um, I'm just going to add a few of these and then I'm going to click add resources. So add resources. What I want to do is look up quizzes. And actually there are a number, a, a large number of 3D for medical quizzes that are there. I actually don't make them at all myself because there's loads and loads and loads of them there. And I'm familiar with the ones that I use pretty frequently. Filter by head and neck, view that content. One of the lectures that I had is the anterior triangle. So I'll definitely put a quiz, an anterior triangle, divisions um, and borders. Um, maybe I want to do the muscles as well. Um, definitely want to nurse by the larynx. Okay, I'm, I'm making this stuff up as I go along here. But what I hope you can see is that there's an awful lot of um, content here that is already made that will hopefully review everything that you need. So save that lecture. It, will, it means you don't have to make it. And what I just want to do is show you what that looks like in um, the content that I've already made. So we'll go to that for apps review. Each one of these is a quiz. So it's not just a question that I'm adding. It's This is a five question quiz. You can see here, I practiced it before I started the presentation. Um, so it says that I'm completed, but if I'm a student, I can go through and do them as many times as I wish. Um, I've set these up so they don't give them immediate feedback on the answer, which one of the following structures doesn't contribute to the outline of superior class capture. Um, let's go with the left and right clavicles. 
um, we'll submit that, move on to the next one. Um, no, that's the correct answer. I'm not going to read the questions, but I'm going to put in some random answers here that I don't necessarily know are correct because I'm just going to show you what the five questions look like. Um, the structure labeled A, it's a pretty basic spot question format with a multiple choice answer, answer um, and submit those. What I can then do is it gives me, I guess, very well um, that I got four out of five answers correct. And I can go through and check how I did, which ones I got right. So question one, um, any of those two of the right answers. I just happened to click on the right answer in this one without necessarily reading the question. I got that answer wrong. So the one highlighted in white is the one that I answered. Red shows me it's incorrect and green is what the right answer would be. And then I got that one right as well. Fantastic. Well done. I should hope so. Um, I can leave that quiz and then move on to, oh, sorry, I didn't see that. I can leave that quiz and then move on to the next one as I wish. So looking at the intercostal spaces if I want to, because I have just done that dissection today. Um, again, very straightforward so to identify structures in that spot question for me. Um, but what I really hope is that this gives students a holistic view on what they're dissecting and how they're going to get the most out of the dissection um, that they are doing themselves without necessarily st somebody standing over their shoulder. What I hope is that they can look at complete anatomy, see the structures labeled that they want to see, and then they can answer whatever questions they might have about their dissection, which is usually, what is this? And can I dissect it? Or can I cut it? Um, so I will stop at this point and take any questions you might have, if there's anything more that I can help you with. Thank you so much, Olivia. That was um, really great. So just uh, wanted to remind the audience, you know, please do feel free to, to put in any questions that you may have for Olivia um, into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, she can answer them live um, and feel free to ask any questions in Spanish as well. We, we still have the interpreter with us so we can um, answer those questions too. So. Um, I see there's one question that's come in um, into the Q&A box. So uh, Olivia, do you have uh, photorealistic images of specimens that could be added to the modules? I imagine this would give a slightly more realistic picture and clarify what the students have to cut into. Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> Sorry, I thought we were over that. Let me just share my screen with you um, again, just to show you how I might do, how I might be able to include that. Um, the first thing I want you to note is that there's a couple of guided dissections, um, pelvis here and abdomen, um, and they are guided dissections with photorealistic videos of photorealistic material in them. But if I wanted to add um, effectively the exact same thing into one of these screens, I can always use the import tool. So go over here to my tools and import picture. Um, I'll show you what this brings up. So it just brings up my files, right? Um, and I can just put a screenshot or whatever text that I have that might be useful from the, um, from maybe I've taken a screenshot from the textbook that I want to use. Um, I don't, I, I'm not going to import one of my screenshots because God only knows what they are, but you, it just opens up your desktop and it allows you to import an image. And then that image appears is the exact same as um, a text box does. And then you can just, manipulate it, you can shrink it down, a student can expand it and fill their um, iPad, window, view, whatever it is, with that image, and then they can shrink it back down and put it into the side of um, their screen again. So if you're looking for, um, this would be a really nice way to complement that phrase dissector text, because it has all of those images included in it anyway, just export one of those images from clinical key and pop it into complete anatomy to give them um, that holistic view. Great, thank you, Olivia. Uh, we have another question that's come in. Um, is it possible to share courses that um, a professor makes with other professors in the same department? Yes, it is. And I can actually share these with my students as well. So um, we would put all educators and students into a group. And then those groups would be, um, the students can see everything that is inside um, that course. So you could share that course with either my colleagues or the students. Obviously, you would want to share them with everybody. Um, 
I could even share them across institution if I wanted to, if, if I had, um, you know, if somebody asked me for that content, I could share it with them across an institution. It's not necessarily locked into my institutional license either. Great. And you kind of touched on this with the, you know, using a 3D tool, but is, can you think of anything, you know, does complete anatomy directly address any limitations of cadaveric dissection at all? I think the biggest limitation is the monochromatic, what is this sort of issue. So um, what I see quite often, I teach an awful lot of undergraduate medical students who are looking at prosections. Um, what we try and do quite often is mirror the prosection on complete anatomy with a load of labels on it. The limitation of cadaveric anatomy is that it doesn't have labels. Um, and what is so useful that CA can absolutely do is add those labels. Like it's really simple just to stick a label on it. You don't even necessarily have to be working inside a screen. You can be just working in that um, model home view and click on a structure and the name of that structure comes up straight away. Um, that is, I think, what is the most useful element that you know where it can bring it forward into um and address those limitations of cadaveric uh anatomy we have so many students who stand over a pro section and go i don't know what i'm looking at or <laughs> is that the aorta and you're like no that's the esophagus you know we're close but we're really far away and they can definitely answer those questions themselves so helping them to construct their own knowledge um without necessarily a didactic influence and somebody having to stand there and teach them through it it's resource light for us as educators um, but also allows them to construct their own knowledge, which is where we know better learning happens. That's great. Um, it helps with the, the sciatica nerve, as, oh. well, as you mentioned. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, well, thank you for that. So um, do you have any strategies that you would recommend for tailoring the use of 3D tools for diverse classroom settings? Um, I guess the fact that complete anatomy is multilingual um, I, at the University of Edinburgh, we have an awful lot of students from an awful lot of different places. Mm -hmm. I think in our, gosh, in our master's programs, there is certainly less than a quarter of them use English as their first language. Okay. Um, so we can't necessarily assume, yes, we are teaching in English and yes, they are all competent in English, English but they may be more comfortable um, learning anatomy in, their, in a different language and then translating it through to English. Um, so with the flick of a switch, they can do that on complete anatomy. I don't necessarily have to, obviously with a textbook in hand, the textbook is in English. You can't just change the language in the textbook um, like that, but thankfully they can do it in complete anatomy. They can open up all of those screens, change the language and it's, um, or Latin. We know an awful lot of students learn in Latin as their primary language, certainly European um, universities quite often teach anatomy in Latin. Um, and practice in Latin, but uh, so they can change that um, the language straight away, which allows, uh, granted diversity comes in an awful lot of different packages, but one of them being language and, and quite often the diverse uh, cultures that come into our classroom. But um, certainly from that perspective, it is a massive help. You can't do the same thing with a textbook. Yeah, that's a, that's a great perspective. Yeah. And uh, just a reminder for the other participants, you know, please feel free to to put your questions in uh, before we wrap up. Um, and I, I'm also curious, Olivia, do you, can you share any feedback that you've received directly from students about how their dissection has gone with, you know, using these types of tools? Um, I, I, I don't think I can, Daphne, and I know it's terrible for the webinar, <laughs> but they don't really know what it would be like without it. It's That's kind of, um, you know, it's a bit like saying to them, what would they do without a textbook? Um, they don't, know what they're missing out on. I think it's just always quite positive feedback. Granted, they're also students, so they have many things that go, could we please have more? Can we please have less? Can we, you know, they'll always ask for things. But um, what I can tell you is that I did this course. I did the master's program in Edinburgh in 2017. Um, I wasn't the complete anatomy pioneer at that point, but I certainly was, I was very pro it. It is the only reason I graduated from that course. Um, but I remember a lot of people being like, oh, what's that? What is that? You know, and, and kind of slowly over time, we integrated on a less formal platform, um, but we integrated its use. Um, it definitely had an iPad integration at that point, but like it was, it was really, it was the the baby product. that was, <laughs> So it didn't have languages. It didn't have an awful lot of things, but what it did was the basics of what complete anatomy does well, which is 
identify a structure that you don't know, you can open up the app. You can go that artery branches off there, you know, use the branching tool, use whatever. And then it didn't have a branching tool at that point, but you can just take, click on the artery and then find the name of it. And that provides so much context. I wish, um, it's like opening a window and, and seeing light, you know, when you can identify what that structure is without knowing what it is, you can't know what it branches from or where it's going to. Um, but being able to like throw open those windows and, and show the students what that structure is so easily. Um, it's not like a, pew, 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 <laughs> a textbook or whatever. Granted, it's it's like giving them Google search for the first time, you know. Oh, that's great. That's great. It's good to have that perspective. Um so another question that's come in, do you also use complete anatomy for explanations and pathology, for example, with the fracture tool? And what other options do you see for explaining diseases apart from manual annotations? Um, so when we're teaching in the dissection lab, we actually, we stray away from talking about pathologies for the most part. Um, granted, all of our cadavers um, have plenty of pathologies um, and an awful lot of anatomical variation but we really try to stray away from pathology. So I can't give you much advice on that only because we don't use it. Um, you know, there's the growth tool, there's the kind of bone spurs and as you said, fracture tool, um, but we're not, uh, we're trying really hard. We have an awful lot of medics and they really try and learn an awful lot about pathologies within the lab, but we have to really try quite hard to bring it back down to anatomy because they are purely anatomy students for the most part. Um, and without that solid foundation, it's it's very easy to get distracted by the fun, interesting pathology um, stuff. But without, without the foundation in anatomy, it's very, very difficult um, to understand what the abnormal or what the pathology looks like. So we do try and focus on the anatomy. So I'm definitely not the best person to answer that question. <laughs> That's great. I hope that answers your question. Um, I see a new one coming in. He says, thank you. <laughs> um, maybe one final question, if uh, there's none other from the audience. Um, so um, how, how do you envision the future of anatomy education evolving with the continued integration of technology like uh, complete anatomy? Well, that's a tough one, Daphne. Yeah, <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> what does the future look like? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'll just take out my crystal ball here. Um, yeah. <laughs> It's hard because two years ago, three years ago, this wasn't how we were teaching. Um, it, it's all changed so much in the last uh, in the last couple of years and technology and integration for the better sometimes because we had to. Um, but I think we're going backwards in order to go forwards. We're not like, you know, we're taking that one step back to go back to the cadaveric anatomy because what we've been able to do is try a lot of different things in the last couple of years, being forced to try them. Um, but we're still going back to what we know is um, is the bread and butter. And, and that is cadaveric anatomy. There's definitely things that we can add on. Maybe we can add on VR. Maybe there's a point when I can put a headset on over the mm -hmm. cadaver and it automatically labels everything. You know, if, if we could submit that for request to Elsevier, that would be fantastic. <laughs> I'll make a note of that. <laughs> that would be great. Thank you. Um, but, you know, maybe that's what I can do, that it can it can understand what I'm looking at and it can label them straight away. And, and I don't have to look away from the cadaver, try and translate it to what's on the iPad and put it back, um, you know, apply that information back to the cadaver. So, you know, maybe that's where it is. I don't know. Um, what we I think we've seen so far and, and what our experience is, is that we're definitely going to stick with our cadaveric based um, anatomy teaching. So I'll take that off as confident for the future. Um, but what, how we can apply that, I think, um, is yet to be defined, but there's definitely potential. There's loads of potential there. Yeah, definitely a lot of new things coming, I'm sure. So um, that's great. Well, um, I'll give one more moment for anyone to send in any final questions. Um, just as we wrap up, um, I just want to let everyone know that there we did record the session today, so we'll be sending those out by the end of the week. Um, in the meantime, feel free to get in touch with us with any further questions that we'll we can be happy to forward on to Olivia. Um, thank you again, Olivia, for for coming here today and taking your time to explain. Um, all this great information and thank you to Mohammed for um, organizing the webinar and to Joel who has been interpreting for us in Spanish. So we'll speak to you soon. Thanks again for attending and uh,
uh, have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Daphne. Bye.